Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, I would like to welcome you on behalf of both the World Economic Forum and the Mission Possible Partnership um, to our Climate Breakthroughs, the Road to COP and Beyond session, and particularly this Hydrogen for Climate um, session. Um, this, today's event is being run um, in partnership um, and at the invitation of the COP26 presidency um, and high-level champions who we are delighted to partner with and is very much looking at the how do we trigger systemic change and systems change and really to put today into context um, and particularly the critical role of hydrogen in the broader industry transition I would like to hand over to my co-executive director for the mission possible partnership Faustine de la Salle the um, uh, executive director of the energy transitions commission um, as well as co-executive director of the mission possible partnership Faustine Thank you very much, Anthony. It's a pleasure to be with you all today, and I'm really looking forward to today's panel. Um, I wanted to quickly introduce, to remind ourselves of the importance of hydrogen uh, in the context of the transition to net zero emissions that we are um, discussing today with the aim of seeing COP26 really uh, unlocking change in that trajectory towards net zero emissions. Uh, as we all know, to reach net zero emissions by mid-century, we need a completely reshuffling of our energy system. We need a massive scale up in clean energy provision. Um, and one of the key pillars of that transition, uh, and we've uh, recently, as the Energy Transitions Commission, uh, published a report on that subject, is clean, clean electrification. Clean electrification will really be uh, the massive underpinning for the transition towards net zero emissions. But there are a range of sectors where clean electrification is not currently possible. And that includes a number of the sectors that we are particularly addressing and looking into via the Mission Possible Partnership. Um, those include heavy industry sectors, uh, heavy duty transport sectors, heating, both residential and um, uh, industrial. And those sectors need to find solutions beyond electricity. And hydrogen really appears like uh, the potential uh, key solution for those sectors alongside sustainable biomass and alongside carbon capture. In our own ETC projections, uh, we consider that hydrogen might represent up to 15% of final energy demand by mid-century, and another 5% or so might be provided uh, by fuels actually built from hydrogen, because hydrogen has this advantage that it can be produced in different ways from renewables, but also from gas if combined by car with carbon capture. And it has this flexibility that it can be transformed into other things, like ammonia, less synthetic fuels. branch of sectors across the economy. The key challenge we're facing really is the scale up of that clean energy provision. Today, clean energy provision, so low carbon energy provision, represents less than 1 million tons globally. And we need that to be brought to potentially up to 800 million tons by mid-century. This is a massive scale up that we are talking about um, today. That massive scale up really needs to be unlocked in the 2020s. If we act too late, it will be impossible to, ra to raise those levels of production high enough to meet our mid-century targets. And so the discussion today, and I'm really looking forward to hear all of our panelists on the subject, is how do we unlock that scale up in the 2020s um, to really ensure that we can meet those um, mid-century targets. In our latest uh, ETC report on hydrogen, uh, we've laid out that there are three critical things uh, that need to happen in the 2020s. One is to scale up volumes of production to really unlock economies of scale. We need to bring down the cost of hydrogen below $2 uh, per kilogram, the cost of clean hydrogen. Um, but growing production volumes will be insufficient if there's no demand for those volumes. And so there's really a chicken and egg issue that needs to be cracked thanks to collaboration across the value chain to really understand how we grow at the same time uh, the production side, but also the consumption side across multiple sectors. We will need multiple sectors to be demanding clean hydrogen before 2030 to really enable uh, that whole value chain to be built up. And we will also need progressively to develop transport and storage infrastructure, both on a local basis and on a global basis. 
So a lot to be done, a lot that will require skill sets uh, from across the whole uh, hydrogen value chain. Uh, and I'm really looking forward today to hear from our panelists how this can be done and what the role of their different companies will be uh, in that process. Uh, Anthony, uh, pleasure uh, to hand over to you to run us through that, that panel. Uh, thanks a lot again for having us today. Fasting, thank you. And we have an excellent panel of experts and, and business leaders to talk about this critical topic. Before I introduce our panelists and, and get into our conversation, I would just like to encourage you, um, the audience, to, to take part as well. And you can do that um, by using Slido. So if you, uh, if you put your phones up to the QR code or you log in slido.com and use the hashtag climate breakthroughs, you can then submit questions, um, which we can then take on board and, and put to our um, and panelists in the second part of our discussion. So please do that. Now, without further ado, um, as they always say, um, I'm going to quickly introduce our panelists and then I have a question for each of them to, to get us started. So we have... Um, uh, we're very, very lucky indeed to have uh, Juan Carlos Chauvet, the Minister of Energy from Chile. Um, we are, again, um, privileged to have Catherine McGregor, the CEO of Engi Group, um, with us on the panel today. Um, and now I think we, we feel like old hands, Mads, you and I have been on a number of these panels in the last year or so. Mads Nipper, the CEO of Austed. Um, yeah, an amazing story, one of those companies that, that has really transformed itself in, in recent years. Um, and Bernd Hyde, uh, the senior partner, a senior partner at McKinsey, who leads McKinsey's work on hydrogen, and I understand has worked very closely with Chile and, and developing their strategy. Very much looking forward to hearing more about that. Um, and Magnus Ankerstrand, Executive Vice President for Clean Ammonia at Yara International. You know, I think in a few years' time, we will be talking about a very exciting transformation and story uh, around that, uh, Magnus. So looking forward to hearing more. Um, Minister, I'd like to, to start with you, if I may. Um, Chile has emerged as one of the world's key leaders uh, in the future of, green, of the green hydrogen economy. So. Why is that? What, what does your country see as its strategic advantage in green hydrogen to be so bullish about it and to really sort of invest um, in this future? And what do you think needs to happen for other countries to join you in this global movement? Well, thank you, Anthony. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's great to be here with you. Um, as Christine greatly summarized, we, we think green hydrogen is like the, the missing link to be carbon neutral by 2050, right? So in Chile, we're, we're doing what many countries are doing. We're cleaning our electricity generation capacity to then use that clean and cheap electricity to replace fossil fuels across our economy in transportation, heating, industries, and so on. But that plan that works pretty well has that problem, right, that we don't, we I mean, there are certain sectors that are very hard to electrify, and green hydrogen would be essential there, right? In our case, mining, for example, which is our biggest industry, they need to replace diesel that they use in their trucks, and green hydrogen looks as the best option to do that. And that is true in shipping, uh, which is very important for us. We are a very open economy, but distant from uh, export markets. So the, the carbon footprint of shipping is going to be very important. We have a big... Uh, agricultural industry, so clean fertilizers produced from hydrogen would be very important as well. So green hydrogen would be very important to clean our own economy, but also opens a great opportunity to export our natural resources to the world. Chile probably has one of the best natural resources to produce clean electricity. We have uh, in terms of quantity and quality, right? In terms of quantity, we have identified 1,800 uh, gigawatts of potential uh, resources to produce clean electricity. And we consume around uh, 25 of those, right? So we need to find ways to export that to the world. So we have a lot of resources, and those resources are very good. We have capacity factors in solar PV of over 37% in the north, in the Atacama Desert, and wind factors onshore, especially in Magallanes, of over 70%. And since the cost of electricity is essential to reduce the cost of producing green hydrogen, we are probably in the 
pole position to produce cheap green hydrogen quickly so that we can replace fossil fuels with green hydrogen. So we're working very aggressively to use those resources to produce green hydrogen and its derivatives, uh, green ammonia, synthetic fuels to export those resources to the world. Uh, I think we have other things that are important, a stable env uh, business environment, a very well-developed electricity market and others uh, that we can come back later in the Q&A. Uh, I think many other countries are joining these, this industry as well. But since cost is the biggest driver, especially in this early stage, those countries that have the best natural resources will probably be in the, in the best position to join in first. But we are cooperating with many other countries. We need th This is not a race, uh, a competition between countries. It's, I, I, the way we see it, it's a competition between all countries together against fossil fuels in a way, right? So we need to accelerate the development of this industry. We're cooperating with many other countries that have good resources to try to break through <laughs> all the challenges we, we have that we can come back later in the, in the Q&A. Minister, thank you. And I like that. It's, it's not a race against each other. I think in, in many ways, it's, it's a race we, we all need to win collectively and together. And collaboration is an incredibly important part of that. Um, Catherine, if I could turn to you, uh, if I may. Um, your company is an active member of the Hydrogen Council, um, a global initiative of companies with long-term ambition for hydrogen to foster the clean energy transition. You know, as a major European utility, um, NG also has a role to play in driving electrification efforts forward. And as we know, if we're going to decarbonize the harder to abate sectors, we've not only got to clean up the current um, power supply, we've got to increase it by somewhere in the region of eight, you know, eight times what it is today by 2050. So how do you see um, your company's role in contributing to this broader movement, the sort of collaboration that the minister outlined that we need to provide cheap and widely accessible green hydrogen? Yeah, no, sure. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Thank you for reminding also our contribution to the or participation to the Hydrogen Council, where we're actually also quite active in the Energy Transition Commission as well, right, as part of uh, the, the effort that uh, that uh, that you, you are you are co-hosting. So, very nice to be here. Um, last week, in fact, uh, at NG, we shared with the financial market a strategy update where we made several announcements. One of them uh, was our carbon neutrality horizon to 2045 on all scopes. And as part of that, uh, we uh, contributed or we gave more color on our coal exit plan, which included, by the way, Minister, you know, the the, the plan that we have in Chile to exit coal and uh, add uh, quite a bit of capacity in renewables. So, you know, that was uh, 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 the, 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 the carbon neutrality in action and, and putting Chile in, in, the, in this as a centerpiece. So, so that, that was a nice event. Other announcement uh, during that, that uh, strategic update that, that I gave was indeed a strong ambition in renewables capacity, uh, which is obviously going to be very uh, important when we get to the, the green, uh, to the green uh, hydrogen. So, what we said is that at NG, we're going to be very focused on renewable energy and infrastructure. And while we do that, renewable electricity infrastructure, we are also helping decarbonizing our customers. So this is what we do at NG. And we have a, a history of uh, being very strong in gas. So we have you know, gas skills, gas infrastructures, and we are be becoming and developing very strong at electricity. And when you take these two characteristics of gas on one hand and electricity on the other hand, the two meet and then you get to hydrogen. So the green hydrogen specifically was quite a centerpiece piece of a strategic update. Uh, indeed, you know, a whole ambition uh, thinking a lot about the affordability of energy as, as a very, very important condition for, for the future of this energy transition. You know, we talk a lot about supply. We talk a lot about reliability. Affordability for our citizens is going to be very important. So the whole question on green hydrogen is, is indeed affordability. And here you really have these two components. You have the cost of the electrolyzers, which is really all around the technology, the manufacturing. And then, of course, you have the cost of the renewable electricity. And this is where we have a lot of ambition. So what we're doing at NG is that we're focusing on all the value chain of the green energy. 
the green hydrogen. So starting on the renewable side, uh, where we have actually already today a pipeline of about 70 projects. And we have said that we have an ambition of having in production in 2025, 600 megawatts of green hydrogen, getting to four gigawatts in 2030. So just to give you an idea of the ramping up and, you know, we have concrete solid pipeline for this project. So we have line of sight on how we're going to get there. So it's going to be really important from a production standpoint. And then, of course, another aspect, which is going to be around transport and storage, where we find that you know, one of the key secrets of the economic side of green hydrogen production is that you will have to produce green hydrogen where cheap renewable or economic renewable energy can be produced. And that might not necessarily be at the same place where you need the green hydrogen. And so the whole story of transportation and storage is going to be quite critical. And this is one aspect that we feel needs to be addressed, you know, from a uh, ecosystem standpoint. So whether it's pipe, whether it's uh, uh, transporting green hydrogen as is, as a gas or as a proxy for hydrogen, ammoniac, etc. So a, a lot of work needs to, to, to happen there. And we are doing a lot of work and energy setting, setting ambition uh, uh, very much uh, towards the transportation and the storage as well. So we have a good plan, a very, very good plan, enabled by uh, ambitious renewable targets. And that's, you know, how we feel we will contribute to the development of a green hydrogen market. Uh, very much looking forward to that. Thank you. Catherine, thank you very much. Um, and next, I'm going to turn to you, Madsen. I feel a lot of people forgot earlier in your career, you, you were a power behind reinventing Lego and making it one of the global phenomenons it, it, it now is. And then you moved on to helping to reframe uh, manufacturing in, in Denmark and led the initiative on, on how to sort of transform manufacturing. Um, and now you've taken over a company that that has had its own amazing journey from, you know, people forget it was the Danish oil and natural gas company. I mean, it's now one of the world's leading offshore wind companies. I mean, an amazing um, transformation into a leading renewable energy um, company. Um, and now hydrogen, um, which is the next powerful story. I mean, the wonderful thing about Lego is you, you can build something and then you can take it apart and turn it into something completely different. Um, so tell us about how hydrogen can, can help us do that um, in, in the global economy and help industry reinvent themselves um, as, as net zero um, sectors. So what is the next step transformation of your company and how does, hi you know, how does hydrogen play a part in that in, and perhaps even the sort of global um, ambitions um, that, that you have uh, as a company? Um, and how do you think you can play a role in mainstreaming um, decarbonisation within the energy and, and in, within en the energy sectors and industrial sectors um, around hydrogen and clean energy? Thanks a lot, Anthony. There, there was enough material for a couple of hours there, uh, but I'll do <laughs> just, just pick one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll do it. I'll do it very quickly. No, no, thanks a lot. But for the people who on the on this session that don't know us, that this exactly like like Anthony said. This is what we used to be the Danish uh, oil and natural gas company. And, and less than 10 years ago, we were one of Europe's most fossil fuel intensive uh, utilities. And we made the, a very dramatic choice, not just to make a slow transformation, which may be referencing what's happening this week in the courtrooms and, and boardrooms of the world. But we actually decided to, to make a radical transformation of our business model. And we are now more than 90 percent. All of our energy production is now more than 90% based on renewables, by far the majority of that in offshore. We are the not just one of, but, but a clear number one in offshore. And we actually like to see ourselves as what we chose to do at the time, and I can say that because I was not part of it, was something that actually probably played a key role in proving that offshore is not only possible technologically, but it's competitive and a cornerstone of the renewable energy transformation. So, but, but, but the danger for our company is that we say, if, if we say now we are through our transformation and it's just all about everybody else doing the same, we, we, we see ourselves as in constant transformation. And one of the next legs on that transformation is, is, is green hydrogen. Because like, like uh, everybody so far have already talked about, the hard to abate sector simply need this to happen. And we, we believe very much in, apart from bold visions, where we, where we, we actually want to be a leader in this field globally, uh, we, we believe very much in acting our way into a new way of thinking and, and start doing things. 
So we actually, at this stage, we have a, a, a tangible pipeline of three and a half gigawatts of, uh, of, of uh, green hydrogen projects together with lots of leading offtake partners because this is really important. It's not just about production. Of course, there are many production-related challenges, but it's really about linking up and partnering with the key offtake partners. And then um, Amounus from Yara is here. Yara is a key partner in one of our most ambitious undertakings, which is a gigawatt scale uh, green hydrogen project in in, uh, in 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 Holland, Belgium, together with also ArcelorMittal uh, with with Sealand uh, Refinery and with Dow Chemicals. So so some of the world's largest offtakers in a very heavy industrial cluster. And we are working now to make it possible to get to a gigawatt scale within this century or this decade, of course. And uh, and that would take two gigawatts uh, of offshore uh, that doesn't exist. So we need to scale dramatically, scale renewable energy. Happy to hear the minister saying that Chile has has an excess, but uh, but in other parts of the world, it really is about accelerating the availability of affordable energy because it is already competitive. But there are many scarce resources in terms of seabed and and uh, and regulatory frames. So we see uh, we actually see green hydrogen as a new as an as a new offshore. Uh, and we believe it's doable, but we do need, and this is where we're also trying together with, uh, with, with, with other, uh, with as many sort of like-minded companies and people as we can, we, we need to ensure that the incentives and policy frames are there. Because it's a little bit of the chicken and the egg is that we all know that advantage, uh, that, that competitiveness of this in terms of price only comes with scale, but we don't get to scale unless we get it off the ground. And, and that is where production-based incentives are, are really vital for an interim period of time. And if we get that support in terms of regulatory frameworks and also sort of level playing field in terms of taxes and transmission fees, th this will scale and it will happen before the end of this century. And Austin will play an absolute key part of, of that as a leading player. Um, so, Mads, thank you. Inspiring as always. Um, Ben, if I may turn to you, um, we've heard a lot about collaboration and transformation. And I mean, that's, that's at the heart of McKinsey's business, helping your clients to transform and, and deal with all the changes that the world throws um, at them. And, and we've seen amazing transformations already. And we're seeing them play out with wind and solar and the costs of those technologies having dropped dramatically. You know, as a result of just a sort of public-private collaboration, we've heard from both the minister and, and Mads describe. Um, and you lead a team um, on hydrogen at McKinsey that's been instrumental in getting strong hydrogen analysis out there, um, both in terms of application, pathways, emissions, and finance requirements. So in your assessment, how do we how do we not only replay that movie that we've seen with wind and solar and now electric vehicles and batteries, but speed it up? Um, and get the cost of hydrogen down, um, you know, and how far do you think we are from doing that? And if, let's just pick up a, a threshold, you know, $2 a kilogram. Um, how do, you know, how do we get away from that? And when do you think we will get there? Thank you, Anthony. And I think you hit on straight to the million dollar question uh, of the cost of, of uh, hydrogen and that transition. So what we did, maybe a bit of context. So McKinsey worked together with the members of the Hydrogen Council. Um, so we heard about the council. That's a CEO led initiative where companies along the full value chain work together in a collaborative way to get the hydrogen transition going. So these are 109 uh, companies around the globe. McKinsey facilitated uh, a clean team and uh, an, an antitrust compliant ring fenced environment where we collected real industry data to calculate exactly these trade-offs. So what we did is we, we, we took 25,000 data points from the the companies in that industry and more or less did uh, different calculations. So in this work, we analyzed, uh, we found that hydrogen can be cost competitive earlier than we anticipated before we did that work. So we come down to levels of two US dollar per kilogram um, before the end of the decade. And just as a reference today, hydrogen from renewable energy is somewhere at the range of, depending on where you are and what endowment with uh, renewables you have, between four and six uh, US dollar per kilogram. So the, the four to six come down to two US dollar 
until the end of the decade. Um, and we even see places, and you heard uh, Minister Jobet uh, speaking of Chile. Chile has great endowment with both wind and solar. We will see places like Chile coming down to 1.3 US dollar per kilogram, but we have also other places. Think of Spain, Middle East, North Africa, Australia, even parts of the US uh, where hydrogen costs from renewables are well under two US dollar or 1.5 US dollars. So what brings us down to these levels? First of all, it is important to have this endowment with uh, cheap renewable energy, both wind and solar. And second, it's the scaling of these electrolyzer capacity that we heard from, from Catherine or Mats or Juan Carlos. So today we have roughly a global installed electrolyzer capacity of somewhere 200 to 250 megawatts. That's tiny. This will be projected to grow somewhere in the range of 100 gigawatts until the end of the decade. So 200 megawatts to 100 gigawatts, that's a factor of 500 in the increase. And this increase in capacity is also the key driver of bringing down the cost of these machines. Today, they range between 700 to 1,000 US dollar per kilowatt mm -hmm. of installed uh, capacity. And this will come down to, to levels of, uh, let's say, 300 and under 400 US dollar per kilogram. That's more than cutting it in half. And the interesting thing is this is not due to a new technology. We have alkaline technology. We have also PEM technology that will stay. But it's more that scaling of the manufacturing processes that today are more like in a an, in an, in an, uh, single unit goes to flow processes. So that brings down, down the cost. And why is this two US dollar as a critical threshold so important? On the one hand, this enables a lot of use cases where hydrogen then becomes more cost competitive than today's conventional technology. Think of diesel or natural gas, or even more competitive than, for example, the next best alternative. Think of, of battery electric. And we have a whole array of applications that is trucking, that is um, shipping, trains, that's even synthetic fuel for aviation, uh, that's industrial use cases like steel, that's ammonia production, uh, that's feedstock in, in industry. And all of these use cases will be enabled with, with uh, cheap uh, hydrogen. And then a second point uh, to close off, this low cost production of hydrogen is also an enabler for a systemic energy transition because you can connect places with endowment of great renewable power, uh, like I mentioned earlier, to demand centers that do not have that cheap energy. So we see hydrogen as an additional energy vector in the mix. So you can think of that almost like this enables exporting of sunshine and wind, um, something that, that we cannot do with electrons alone. Bernd, that, that, that's wonderful. And I, your last point, I think, I think is a fantastic one. You know, today, we've, you know, many of us have grown up in a world where countries with you know, historic endowments of fossil fuels are linked through various um, you know, transport uh, you know, hubs and, and, and routes um, to, the, to the industrial part of the world. And, and you're painting a picture of a world where you know, those countries endowed with, with huge amounts of, of wind, solar, renewable energy will be linked through hydrogen um, to those industrial centers, which I think is incredibly exciting. Um, and you also touched on you know, the, the use of these fuels. I mean, in, in many ways, you know, the, these are the options that many of today's incumbents have, um, you know, and if they follow the, the trailblazing paths of, of, of Orsted and, and Engie, um, they will move into these new fuels. But it also, it's also a great opportunity for, for new players to, to move out of other sectors and into the energy sector. Um, and, and Magnus, you represent just such a company. So Yara is, is known for... Uh, you know, the agricultural um, and food sector. But here is a huge opportunity for your company in energy. Um, so 
how do you see yourself playing a role in transforming sectors such as shipping through green ammonia from their sort of quite current carbon intensive um, mode of power to, to actually creating a whole new um, maritime sector, as, as someone said recently in our Getting to Zero Coalition workshop, um, is as big as a shift. You know, shifting from the current fossil fuel engines to ammonia is as big a shift as going from sail to steam. So, how how do you anticipate playing a role um, as a company in that transition? In that transition. Thank you. Thank you for that question. And uh, first of all, also thank you for uh, having me as a part of this uh, this very distinguished uh, panel. Uh, I think for, for us to work in the fertilizer industry and the ammonia business, you know, th this all seems very evident to us. But obviously, ammonia is, is not necessarily a, a product that's well known uh, globally. But uh, so, so in that context, it, it's probably worth mentioning that uh, as, as the world's largest uh, ammonia producer, we are also actually one of the world's biggest um, hydrogen producers because uh, hydrogen as well as nitrogen is, is the key component in ammonia and the way ammonia is produced today in an ammonia facility, an ammonia plant, uh, the, actually the front end of the plant uh, produces hydrogen and the, and the back end and then takes the hydrogen and, and nitrogen and produces uh, ammonia. And, and interest. Interestingly, if you go back, uh, you know, almost 100 years, uh, we actually produced ammonia with electrolysis. That, that's, that's how we started producing ammonia in, in the first place. And actually, our last ammonia uh, producing facility based on electrolysis was closed down as late as in, in the early 90s. So, so in, many, in many ways, this is, uh, this is back, to, uh, back to history. And of course, the reason that electrolysis was phased out was because natural gas came and steam methane reforming came as a, as a cheaper uh, alternative. Um, I, I think the the key role that ammonia can play can play in in the hydrogen space, and not just as one application, but but as a as a very important early um, application, is of course that ammonia is a significant carrier of hydrogen, and it's a very good carrier of of hydrogen. Uh, in a, in a um, volume unit of uh, ammonia, we can store one point five times the energy than in a volume unit of, of hydrogen. And also from a transportation point of view, um, it needs to be uh, cooled down to 33, minus 33 degrees uh, to be liquefied as opposed to minus 253 uh, degrees. So, so are there some characteristics with ammonia that makes it very attractive? Um, the other part of ammonia is, of course, also that it can be used directly as an application, uh, for instance, uh, as, as a shipping fuel. You don't have to crack it back into hydrogen uh, to make that happen, which of course is also an alternative in the future where, where ammonia can play a role. But I think in particular in, in the shorter run, um, uh, the direct application of ammonia to new uses uh, is important. The fertilizer industry obviously is a, could be a huge off taker going forward in producing green fertilizer. Um, but as you mentioned on the, on the shipping side, it's where, really where we see uh, a significant opportunity because, and, and a totally new market for, uh, for ammonia and hence uh, hydrogen. And, uh, and obviously there needs to be a technolo uh, technological shift. Uh, there need to be dual fuel engines uh, in place and, and so on. But this is technology that is, uh, is quite near. And we have big uh, engine producers today actually working very actively and having prototypes in, in place. Uh, so we believe very firmly that the technology of this will, will develop. Um, and in, in that play, uh, ammonia can play. Um, ammonia will, we believe, be a very competitive uh, zero emission uh, shipping fuel. There are others, of course, as well. Uh, but from a cost perspective, and, and particularly uh, in, in a world where we bring uh, the cost of hydrogen down to two dollar per kilo, uh, that would be a very competitive um, uh, zero emission fuel for the shipping uh, industry as uh, as such. Um, and as, as uh, so the other part of the question, as an enabler for uh, hydrogen, of course, has been mentioned many times, there are a lot of things that need to fall in place for hydrogen to, to take off. Uh, I think that the willingness and the belief for it to happen is, is definitely there. But of course, you need the technology development, the scaling and uh, uh, to, to bring it, bring the cost down. But you also need the logistics to work um, and the incentives along the value chain and so on. And the benefit of ammonia is that to a very, very large extent, the infrastructure and logistics of that market already exists. So uh, put it a little bit black and white and simplified, the day you exchange the steam methane reformer with the electrolyzer, 
basically the rest of the value chain for um, for the ammonia is there all the way down to the end user. Obviously, there needs to be a, a market developed on the, on the end user side, on the shipping side. Uh, but using ammonia um, as the carrier takes away a lot of the different obstacles uh, in the value chain and the logistic chain uh, in between. And uh, uh, finally, as, as we believe, of course, that ammonia will be a application um, and, and not the, the only application of hydrogen. And we do believe that um, in the next decade, in order to bring uh, hydrogen to the scale, uh, ammonia will play a very, very important role. And uh, we believe that particularly the shipping industry is, uh, is a great area where you both get the uh, benefit of abating the CO2 at the ammonia production, but also uh, the emissions from the vessels. Magnus, thank you. Um, and for making that link um, uh, and segue into the, to the shipping session um, after, after this one. Um, Minister, if I could come back to you. Um, next week, I, I think you are hosting the, both the uh, Clean Energy uh, Ministerial, the same ministerial, and also the Mission Innovation Ministerials. Um, innovation is incredibly um, important and, and governments you know in the, in the sort of public private collaboration that we've touched on you know we increasingly i think realizing that governments play an important role in helping to finance early stage innovation for, for any new transition and any new technology could you perhaps just talk a little bit about how critical innovation is to building a global hydrogen um, energy system Yes, Anthony. Yes, we will be hosting Semana MI next week here from Chile. Uh, I invite everyone to join us. We have a great lineup of speakers, so it's it's going to be it's going to be great. So, innovation, as as said, it has been mentioned, is going to be critical to scale up hydrogen at different levels. So, one is electrolyzers, right? The technology is there, but we need to scale it up to reduce costs. So that is something that has been mentioned is is going to be key. Second, as was mentioned as well, on different applications, right? So how do we use green hydrogen or ammonia in shipping, in, in heavy duty transportation, uh, in electricity generation itself, as uh, the, J the Japanese are, are increasingly doing. Uh, and and on, I mean, synthetic fuels are gonna play a very important role here as well, right? So when we talk, when we talk about green hydrogen, actually we talk about green hydrogen itself and ammonia uh, and ecofuels, right? So for example, there, direct air capture is gonna be essential to have a stable flow of carbon dioxide to produce those fuels. Uh, so innovation will be here uh, there as well. And logistics, as was mentioned, right? So it's very hard to move green hydrogen around. <laughs> that is the, the biggest challenge we have. So that's why we, we, most people agree we will start moving around green ammonia as, as synthetic fuels. So innovation is going to be key on, on all those fronts. Uh, um, and I think this is going to take a lot of cooperation between government and the private sector, right? So this is kind of a, the way I think about it is a puzzle, right? So and different countries and companies have different pieces of that puzzle from Chile. We have the natural resources, we have the electricity sector, we will be able to provide the infrastructure, but we will not be able to de develop locally, for example, the technology for have, to have direct air capture. So we will need to, to, to have somebody to bring that technology to complement that with our, our resources. So these platforms in which countries and companies collaborate to, to find those solutions are going to be are going to be essential to scale this industry up quickly as we as we need. Minister, thank you, um, Magnus. I'm going to come back to you if I if I may. Um, we, we're starting to get some great questions in uh, from the audience, and I'm, I'm going to um, pick some of these. Um, Yara is a company. You're, you're a global company, and by the nature of your business, you operate in many developing markets. Uh, 
including Africa. Um, so I think this is a you know a good question for you um, that's coming from someone in the audience. So what is the potential of hydrogen for development in regions like Africa? And how can we make sure in, in, in this new market, in this new opportunity that we build, that these regions um, are part of uh, the development and, and the opportunity um, as well? I mean, I guess to some degree, it's a sort of just, it's a sort of equitable, uh, you know, global south part of the just transition question. Yeah, no, uh, I think that's a um, that's a good and and you know somewhat somewhat complicated question uh, as well. I think um, if I you know our, our business in uh, in Africa primarily is, is linked to downstream stream fertilizer, and I think in a way um, from an emission point of view, in um, uh, with regards to emissions from fertilizer and the total footprint of, of agriculture and so on. Uh, there, of course, green fertilizers could pl play an important uh, role. However, I think uh, in, in terms of value creation, uh, obviously uh, African parts of Africa as well uh, have favorable conditions uh, for, for solar and, and renewable uh, energy. And, uh, and I think uh, um, traditionally also, uh, you know, uh, significant existing gray ammonia production exists in uh, particularly North Africa and ER as well as had uh, production facilities in, uh, in in that region. So I think um, um, as we as these markets develop, although Africa uh, maybe from a, from a project perspective is not the easiest first project to uh, to develop. I think over time uh, we should definitely make sure to to review uh, Africa and and the resources that sit there. Also, in terms of, uh, for instance, solar energy, in terms of uh, making projects, uh, hydrogen and ammonia projects available uh, in Africa as well, and, and particularly taking use of the existing uh, ammonia infrastructure uh, that is already there, uh, which of course. Uh, can be then uh, used in uh, as as natural gas is is being phased out, which is of course is is also in an important element for the oil and gas producing countries of Africa that you know rely heavily on um, on uh, fossil uh, fossil energy uh, production um, on their um, uh, in their in their economies where where this could be a solution. Thank you, uh, Magnus. Sorry, just just reviewing the the many questions that that are coming in. Um, unfortunately, we don't have we can't really uh, address all of the questions, but but I'm trying to sort of pick a representative sample. Um, the next question, um, actually, Bernd, I'm going to come back to you as a sort of maybe a you know a neutral uh, advisor and observer and advisor um, in this market. Um, we touched on, you know, you talked about bringing the cost down and, and we've heard from you and others about the, the, the need for this public-private collaboration, the right policy frameworks. So this question from the audience really goes to that in many ways. So what is your view on the policy support schemes for hydrogen development? What kind of regulatory framework and enabling measures are needed to support the growth of hydrogen? And I guess in many ways, you know, achieve those cost reductions you talked about. So first of all, um, and actually, we, we as we speak, we do an, a policy scan uh, across the globe and uh, and uh, look for the impact of these uh, policy measures on onto the hydrogen economy. Um, statement number one is we do not believe structurally in subsidies or support if there is no fundamental business case. So if there is no long-term viability of these cases, uh, it, it doesn't make sense. So, and, and that being said, of course, we have an economic deficit um, as we speak because electrolyzers first need to come down. A lot of these applications need to be developed. So we see a whole array of different mechanisms around the globe. Think of some governments support the delta of uh, hydrogen production cost today versus what it needs to to break even so think of that as like uh, contracts for difference you have other tax exemptions that support the deployment of hydrogen but there are also infrastructure build-up measures think of, of as pipelines think of uh, um, uh, port terminals uh, and the like and of course, there is an, a massive support, and we see a lot of that happening right now in Europe, 
uh, under the European Green Deal, uh, where we support the, the build up of both green and, and blue hydrogen production uh, capacities. And I think that is important for the next few years. We genuinely also believe that this uh, this will less be needed, uh, let's say, at the end of the decade, because there is an intrinsic positive business case in that, and we just need to 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 get through that that initial uh, investment period. Thank you, uh, Bernd. Mads, I'm going to turn to you. Um, a former a colleague and friend commented on my LinkedIn this week when, when sharing this event, you know, oh my God, not another talk shop, you know, we, we need to get on and we need to, we need real action um, on the ground. And this is very much, I think, what, what the Mission Possible Partnership is about, about landing some very concrete central agreements, or as, as our high-level champion um, partners in this like to say, these race to zero breakthroughs to deliver tipping points. Um and, you know, ultimately, you know, this is all about pump priming systemic change. And we need systems level thinking to do that. And to really get this going in a sustainable way, we need to achieve those those tipping points um, to play out as we're already seeing as in, in wind and solar and electric vehicles and, and batteries. So if we think about tipping points and from your experience now within Orsted, but also your experience uh, working on the sort of the day, the, the, you know, the manufacturing Danish climate partnership um, over the last couple of years, where do you think early demand is most likely to come from? Um, is it specific sectors or do you think it, you know, like shipping that we've heard about from Magnus and we'll hear about in the next sector, mm. sorry, the next, next session, or is it a combination of sectors? And if so, which ones? Yeah, I, I think it, it could very well come from sectors that are under some pressure or under the highest pressure to decarbonize. So take refineries, chemical industry. I, I have very little doubt that those would be amongst the first. Uh, out of principle, I, I think that we ought to strive for deploying green uh, hydrogen and also the, the, the e-fuels uh, uh, or, or green fuels coming from mm -hmm. it further down the value chain where it has the highest abatement value. So in principle, where it eliminates most greenhouse gas emissions. But, but I think the sectors where it's going to be, be most like are those, those under, under, under the biggest pressure. And, and I think every sector has its pioneers. And I think the, 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 the Green Steel Initiative that's been announced in northern Sweden is putting an entire industry hugely under pressure. I think our, our fellow Danish men, Mask's announcement that by 2023, so in two years' time, they will have the first emissions-free vessel on the sea. This is something where companies like, like our immodestly say that Erster did with, with offshore wind. This is where the companies that are leaning out into shorter term, very bold ambitions can actually drive systemic change. But nobody can do it alone. And this is where I think these partnerships were, again, I'll, I'll mention what what uh, what what my team does with with, with Magnus's teams on uh, on combining sort of massive uh, renewable energy gen generation with a, a huge sector like ammonia. How can we how can we work across sectors to create new solutions for them for those for those industries that need it the most? But in short, my answer is probably the the quick the fastest are going to probably going to be those under most pressure: refineries, chemical. But I think shipping, heavy transport, steel is going to come very shortly after. Yeah, no, exactly. And I mean, th this session is not about the, the chemical sector, but in our um, low carbon emitting technologies group, the, the chemicals initiative under Mission Possible, you know, the, the first the first um, really exciting pilot project that's, that's come out of that initiative uh, is, is one between, I think, BASF, SABIC and LIND to build the world's mm -hmm. first electronic steam cracker and, and you know it's, yeah. it's examples of those sort of very concrete pilots and pieces of technology that, that we need um, and then governments to step in and support the scale up of those technologies exactly. as business proves as possible absolutely and and Catherine I'm going to come to you now and, and this is a question I could very well put to 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 government to Minister Javed but I um, but I, I really think this is you know we need a business perspective on this because there's a lot of, you know, understandably, quite often there's a lot of skepticism out there. And we find this all the time when we, we talk to, to various stakeholders. Well, why, you know, business is not going to, to do this. It's not in business's interest. But as we see day in, day out, it actually is because this is about the future for business and about maintaining viable 
companies. So as you assess the sort of the landscape um, and you look at this in terms of, you know, meeting your the, the interests of your stakeholders, um, what do you assess as being the, the one opportunity um, that needs focused multi-stakeholder collaboration to unlock um, and materially contribute to achieving um, those, those breakthroughs um, in, in the context of, you know, the, the climate negotiations at the end of, of this year. So how, how can business really be part of that collaboration alongside governments to help raise collective ambition as we go into COP26? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very vast question. I think... Um, you know, one indeed has to realize that uh, those green hydrogen projects require often several hundred millions of dollars uh, of capex, right, to be able to materialize. And so collaboration is, is absolutely a must. And I, and I did want, by the way, to quote that we actually have a project which is about to start with Yara in Western Australia. Mm -hmm. Yes, where we are going to be producing green hydrogen to produce uh, ammonia. So, and this is, you know, made possible uh, through the Australian government subsidies, which is uh, facilitating this this project. So this is a very nice story about collaboration, and I'm taking mm -hmm. the opportunity of Magnus to be on, on the panel to, to call this this interesting because you know in we have seen a lot of uh, governments packages indeed you know very much targeting hydrogen so the one thing here that I would ask is that those subsidies and those packages get voted and get turned into reality and get to the project very very quickly sometimes calendars drag so much that you know before you actually get the money and the financing for the project you've lost two three years and i think we've all have this uh, sense of urgency so there is maybe one thing that we should push for it's time time is of the essence really really important i think we all agree that subsidies is is really useful to kick start the system but then we have to have a bit of a long standing um, schemes which can withstand the test of time. And so that's really important here. We're more thinking about CFD contract for difference are going to be indeed quite, uh, quite important. I would say, you know, obviously taking a bit of a European perspective here, but the CO2 price and CO2 scheme is really important because this is something that uh, when uh, well established will indeed you know facilitate and accelerate the deployment of a green hydrogen economy and very naturally and in a kind of a, a fairly healthy and equitable way if if well established and and lastly maybe a, a third point and i know you asked me for only one so bear with me uh, is is a little bit around the traceability because when you project a hydrogen market you know hydrogen flowing freely in tubes we're going to have to make sure that uh, th this hydrogen is indeed green so a traceability system which is pragmatic uh, uh, you know not too complicated but at the same time rigorous because you want to be able to make sure that what is green hydrogen is actually green, uh, what is blue is blue, mm -hmm. what is gray is obviously not the one you want in your pipe. You know, these are the type of things that I think we should push for for government to, to help mature the, the, the future policy or the policy that this uh, hydrogen economy needs. Catherine, well, you may have made three points, but it was it was nicely succinct. And we, we've uh, got to where we need to be exactly uh, on time. So uh, as we go into the final um, five minutes of, of this panel, um, I would like to ask uh, each of you um, in, in one minute, one sentence, um, to, to set out or to share one thing with us that makes you believe that hydrogen is here to stay and will play its role um, in decarbonizing energy industry um, and transport. And I think I'm going to sort of take sort of chair's privilege, if I may, um, and, and put my own out there, which is that we've, we've learned a lot from previous transitions, from that collaboration between suppliers, buyers, governments, and finance um, in, in scaling and driving down the cost of technologies like wind, solar, and we're now seeing the same S-curves play out for batteries electric vehicles, that I believe we can do it better and faster um, with respect to hydrogen and, in fact, the entire 
industry transition. So better and faster uh, is my um, contribution, learning from uh, the past. Um, so, Minister, if I could start with, uh, with you. Well, thank you, Anthony. It's, it's, it's hard to do this in a minute, but I think green hydrogen and its derivatives, right? Uh, they have a combination of things that I, I think they make them unique in, in, the, in this new phase. One, as I said at the beginning, they will provide the missing link to solve our biggest challenge, which is climate change. That is very important. Second, are probably the best way to use the enormous renewable resources we have in the, in the world, right? And to move them around if we, if we can solve the logistics, which we, I think we will do. Third, I think the geopolitics of green hydrogen are pretty, I mean, stable, are good, right? The resources are diversified. We don't have, we will not have just like 10 countries supplying 80% of the energy as we have today. So that I think it's very important to help this industry develop quickly. And finally, I think there are a great space in which we can combine both a contribution to the fight against climate change and good business, which I think that combination is pretty unique. Minister, thank you so much. Catherine. It is hard to add something to this, right? So uh, I will just say that um, I believe hydrogen moment has arrived because it is the missing link without which the carbon neutrality to 2050 will not will not be possible. So I, 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 it will happen. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, very quickly. I I think we there may be other alternatives to hydrogen and decarbonize and the things that can be electrified. But we don't have the luxury and the time to wait for those. So betting on existing and scalable technologies will happen. Uh, and, and we are uh, at that tipping point. And as Bam said, this is competitive. It's not a wishful thinking. It will be competitive. And we are in a hurry because we can't negotiate with the planet. So, uh, so it will happen. Thank you. Um, Bernd. I, I get excited uh, around the idea that we found a new energy vector that is able to connect uh, new sources and demand centers for energy, that is able to connect different industries that are also hard to abate. And what gives me confidence that this is here to stay is uh, we looked at the, at the global investments. There are more than 300 projects already out there. This is a cumulative 150 billion US dollar that already has flown into that sector. And we see right now, as we track that constantly, that's a billion per week. A billion per week is currently added. So that gives me confidence that we are here having a, a flywheel momentum that, that is, is moving. Thank you, Bernd. Um, Magnus. Yeah, I, I think I would, uh, would emphasize that, that hydrogen is, is the energy carrier that, that can connect all the different renewable sources wherever they are in the world with, uh, with the different users wherever they are in the world without you know, needing groundbreaking technology either on the production side or on the user side, which, uh, you know, turning to, to Matt's point, is that uh, we don't have an option to wait for something else. It, it, it works. The technology is known. It's, it's a matter of bringing all the different pieces together and, and making it happen. Wonderful. Well, look, thank you all very much. Um, I would like to thank all of you. Um, Faustine, for my co-executive director at the Mission Possible Partnership, for her opening remarks. Um, and then each of you, Minister um, Catherine, Mad, Spurned, and Magnus, for, for an excellent conversation, a very well-informed conversation. And I have to say, at the end of this panel, I, I really am filled with, with confidence and a belief that we can do it you know, better and faster um, and I think everyone's, you know, everyone's depending on us. So um, thank you.